Okay, so this is a video that's gonna go over basically nursing fundamentals, nursing foundations. Um, so we're gonna go through safety and hygiene and infection, and I'm gonna share my screen and we're going to pull up some objectives so that we know what we're gonna be focusing on throughout the course of this lecture. So share my screen and there are the objectives. So the first set of objectives is about vital signs and procedures used to measure vital signs, height, weight. Um, so apical heart rate, you place the diaphragm and the stethoscope at the mid left clavicular line and go down to between the fifth and sixth intercostal space. That's what's called the PMI, point of maximum impulse. And that's where you are gonna be able to auscultate the strongest cardiac sound. And what you should hear is a nice regular rhythm, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, and the rate should be 60 to 100 beats per minute. Any kind of irregularity in the beat, if it's not like a marching band, it's irregular. If it sounds like a jazz band, lub dub, lub dub, da dub 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 dub. That's irregularly irregular. If there's a repetition to the weird beat, then it can be regularly irregular. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub dub dub. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub dub dub. Easyauscultation.com is a great website to go to. You will be able to hear real heart sounds and lung sounds. Uh, when we are assessing temperature, uh, what with COVID-19, um, uh, not tympanic, temporal temperatures, are being done more frequently when it comes to checking adults. 98.6 is within normal limits. Anything greater than 101 is considered pyrexia, which is a fever. Um, anything between that 98.6 and that 101 could be what we call a low grade temp, um, but it would be based on clinical judgment whether you'd be concerned about it or not. Right, based now, on our, circumstances. our, um, our, uh, protocol study guidelines. By the study, yeah, that were we were given, uh, say ninety seven six or ninety seven five to ninety or ninety seven. God, ninety seven six or ninety seven seven to ninety nine. I'm gonna let me five. elaborate. Right. So there's no such thing. The word normal doesn't exist. Right. It's a horrible word because it's a subjective word. As nurses, we focus on objectivity, right? We don't want our opinion because if I tell you that something is large, it might be large to me, but when you look at it, you might think it's small, very subjective, right? Words like big and large and small, words like normal or typical or average, right? They're not great words, but they're sometimes all we have to work with when we're talking about ranges because vital signs, just like everything else, are dependent upon the person who you're checking, right? So age is a factor. When children are, you know, when a baby is a baby, heart rate is higher. A fetal heart rate is 110 to 160 beats per minute. As the child starts to grow, the heart rate will start to come down. That's why with an adult, a normal heart rate is 60 to 100. Temperature, when you're looking at older people, geriatrics, you're gonna find that most older folks are going to have a temperature that's in the 97 something range. And that's okay. Why? Basic metabolic rate slows down with age. They lead usually a more sedentary lifestyle. Thyroid function starts to slow down with age, which also affects the base metabolic rate. And so all of these things bring that body temperature, the core temperature a little bit lower than maybe your average, typical, healthy adult you know, at a 98.6. So there are ranges for all these numbers because there are that many different types of people. When we listen to lung sounds, we are auscultating anterior chest wall, right and left. And then we are also auscultating posteriorly. Um, there are five lobes in the human lungs. There are two on the left and three on the right. And the best way to auscultate is when you're auscultating posteriorly, I usually will start at the right upper lobe, listen, and then I will go to the left upper lobe, the right middle lobe, the left lower lobe, and then the right lower lobe. So you're doing like a zigzag pattern, okay? 
And all you should hear are vesicular sounds. Vesicular sounds are normal breath sounds. Just <sighs> the sound of air moving in and out. You should not hear adventitious sounds. Adventitious sounds are anything outside of that whooshing, you know, normal vesicular breath sound. So in other words, you could, you could hear crackles, coarse crackles or fine crackles. They are an indicator of fluid in the lungs, pulmonary edema, which is usually associated with congestive heart failure. You may hear ronchi. Ronchi are, it, it's the sound of mucus or phlegm. It's associated with bronchitis or pneumonia, you know, any inflammatory or infectious process in the lungs. And the thing that makes it distinctly different is if you ask your patient to take a deep breath and cough, <clears throat> then they may be able to mobilize those secretions in their lungs and the ronchi may break up. You may hear something called strider. Strider is a crowing sound that is with inspiration and expiration. <laughs> that's an obstruction. That's air that's not able to get in or out. That's a problem. That's an emergency. Strider is an emergency. And that's usually heard right at the base of the throat, which is the bifurcation of the bronchus, the main bronchus, okay? You may hear um, wheezing. Wheezing is indicative of things like asthma, obstructive pulmonary disorders, things that cause the bronchial passageways to kind of tighten. So with all those chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, which include asthma, emphysema, and chronic bronchitis, you may hear during an exacerbation of that disease, expiratory wheezing. The big problem with COPDs, they can get the air in, but they can't get it out. So what you'll hear is they breathe in and then you'll hear, it's almost musical, right? It sounds like a little flute or something cute. And so expiratory wheezing is very typically found with asthma, status asthmaticus or COPD. Okay. And that's just a tightening or obstruction of the airways. I had that. I, I breathed like that after I had uh, Eli. Right. And, for and a while. That's, yeah. And that's not unusual. After you have a baby, your white blood cell count is elevated. You sometimes will present with some mild wheezing and it has to do with, you know, you had a cesarean section. So that's residual effects of, of, you know, the anesthesia that you had, even though it was um, not general anesthesia, but uh, epidural. I couldn't think of the word, right? Um, so there, there are lots of different reasons. Your body goes through a traumatic event when you have a baby. People don't look at it like that. Same thing with when you have surgery. If it's an elective surgical procedure, people think, well, I mean, it's not a big deal because I'm choosing to have it. Your body doesn't understand the difference between having a baby, having surgery, or falling off a 20-story building. All of those things are traumatic to your body's homeostatic state, right? Homeostasis means that everything in your body's working together and everything's at peace. You're like, you're zen, right? Whenever there's an insult or a compromise to any part of the body systems, you are not in homeostasis and your body will respond accordingly. And the body, by the way, is amazing in its compensatory mechanisms. So there are tons and tons of ways that certain body systems can compensate for deficits in other body systems, right? And we'll get to all that as we move down the line with you know, more nursing things. Um, all right, so we talked about adventitious lung sounds and how to auscultate. And by the way, respiratory rate that's within normal range for adults is 12 to 20 breaths per minute. Uh, we talked about temperature. We talked about auscultating heart sounds and uh, blood pressure. Uh, blood pressure, you want to use the correct cuff that's the correct size for the patient. They make bariatric cuffs, which are for you know, obese patients. They also make pediatric cuffs, which can sometimes be used for very frail, thin, cachectic patients. But if you use the wrong size cuff, you're going to get an incorrect reading. When we talk about blood pressure, that's even more of a wide range of what's normal, right? And so the American Heart Association's most recent guidelines 
say that a normal blood pressure is in the range of 140 over 70. However, there are people that have blood pressures. For example, my blood pressure is 100 over 60, 110 over 62. For me, that is my baseline. That's where I live and it's normal and I'm not symptomatic. In other words, I'm not dizzy. You know, I don't have any issues with postural hypotension. In other words, orthostasis, where change of position will drop my blood pressure precipitously 10 points or more, right? That's what postural hypotension is. Orthostatic hypotension, it means when the patient goes to get up, when they move, their blood pressure drops 10 millimeters of mercury or more. And that's a problem because when the blood pressure drops that much, they'll be symptomatic. They'll feel dizzy or lightheaded. And then there's the risk of them falling, right? So you always want to be aware when you're getting somebody out of bed for the first time, you will always check their blood pressure when they're sitting up, dangling their feet over the bed. You wait a couple seconds, couple minutes, and then have them stand and check their blood pressure again and make sure that there's not a drop. There will be a drop, but it shouldn't be 10 millimeters of mercury or more, either systolically or diastolically. Okay. And when we talk about systolic and diastolic, we're again going back to that love dub and the, the cycle, the cardiac cycle. So blood pressure is a measurement of the left ventricle, how hard it's working to push the blood through the aortic valve, into the aorta, and into systemic circulation so that you get adequate oxygenated blood to your brain and your organs and your tissues and everywhere else, right? So how much force is being exerted against the walls of the arteries, right? So that's what we're measuring. And we're measuring the, the one stage of the pumping, which is the systolic, and then the relaxation stage is the diastolic. Um, did they go over mean arterial pressure? No? Okay, so we won't get to that yet. All right. So anyway, um, that's blood pressure, all right? And you always want to make sure that when you look at a systolic greater than 150, when you look at a diastolic that's greater than 80 or 84, you're concerned a little bit. Is this their baseline or are they hypertensive, all right? And then the other thing that's a factor too, with age, just remember this, when it comes to things like vital signs and risk for disease processes, there are two very fragile groups and it's the very old and the very young, right? With the very old, as people age, just like a car wears out, well, people's body parts will start to wear out. They don't work as effectively as they did when the person was younger. So you'll find older people are immunocompromised. Their immune system doesn't respond as quickly as it used to when they were younger. You will find changes in vital signs because of the aging process. Arteriosclerosis, which is hardening of the arteries or stiffening of the arterial walls, can cause a spike in blood pressure with older age. They're not as elastic. Right, they're not as elastic. And so therefore you will see blood pressures in older folks a little bit higher than maybe they were when they were younger, right? Um, so there, there are lots of things to take into consideration. Every body system is affected by the aging process to some degree, right? And vital signs are not excluded from that. You know, um, older folks, if you ask them to, you know, to take a deep breath and give me a good cough when you're listening to their lungs, they may be like, <laughs> You know, they may not have the strength. That's why it's important as far as patient education to make sure patients know that if you take care of stuff on the front end, then you won't have as many problems on the back end, right? So that's very important. You want to try to stay in shape. Even things like building muscle mass to prevent osteoporosis in postmenopausal women. Osteoporosis is a porosity a weakening riddling of the bones that occurs postmenopausally because of estrogen diminishing. And um, one of the ways to prevent it is to do weight bearing exercises and, and build muscle mass. The more muscle mass a woman has before she goes into menopause, the less likely she's at risk to develop osteoporosis. So aging affects everything, including vital signs. Like I said, temperatures are usually lower with age. Blood pressures are usually higher. Heart rates can usually be a little irregular. And never, never, never use a pulse oximeter to assess a patient's heart rate. 
always auscultate it with your stethoscope because especially with older folks, putting a pulse oximeter on a patient's finger and reading the capillary bed may give you a heart rate that's not even remotely close to what you would hear apically. And that has to do with the aging process on the vascular system. So it's important to know that that is not the way to assess a heart rate, okay? And furthermore, when it comes to a pulse ox or any electronic equipment that we use, they're wonderful, they are. However, they have limitations. So if you put a pulse ox on me right now and it read 78, what would you think? What's the blood pressure? No, pulse ox. Oh, what's the pulse? 78? 78%. What would you think? Did you say 78? I said 78. I think that's way too low. Right, but okay, you put a pulse ox on me just now and you read 78. Look at me. Oh, for the heart rate. No, no. For the pulse ox. We're talking okay. about oxygenation. I'm making a point about electronics. If the pulse ox says 78% ox. Oh, and I'm looking at you, actually you, I would right. think it was wrong. Right, right. Okay, yeah. Right. So you would say to yourself, well, she's not cyanotic and she's not short of breath. So she looks fine to me. She can't yeah. be 78. So what I'm saying is don't rely heavily on electronics. Look at your patient. Look at your patient. Always look at your patient, right? You will learn that the minute you even lay eyes on somebody, you're assessing them. You're looking at their stature, their posture, you're looking at their skin, you're looking at their body weight, you're looking at their hair. You're, you're looking at so many things that half your assessment is done before you even open your mouth and talk to your patient. Mm -hmm. Promise. So, all right. Um, communication skills required to report and document vital sign measurements. Objective, 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 objective. When you are documenting and reporting, say you're giving report to an oncoming nurse and you're the nurse that's going off shift, just the facts, please, like a cop, right? Mrs. Jones is a 78-year-old Caucasian female. She is awake, alert, and oriented. She's in for uh, arthroplasty of the right hip. Her blood pressure is 102 over 64. Her heart rate is 76 and regular. Her respiratory rate is 14 breaths per minute. Her temperature is 97.6. She's pulse oxing 92% on room air at rest. She has comorbidities of hypertension and osteoporosis that she takes alendronate once weekly for her osteoporosis. And she takes uh, lisinopril five milligrams daily for her hypertension, which she manages it very well. So just the facts, right? The numbers, right? Um, when it comes to communication skills, when you're talking to other practitioners, you want to you wanna try to not ever have any type of opinion influencing what you're reporting, right? Let's say you found a patient, you're, you're doing rounds, and you find the patient in their room and they're on the floor, okay? You can't assume anything right? Because you don't know what happened because you didn't see what happened. All you know is, is that you walked in the room and the patient's on the floor, right? So if they're awake, alert, and oriented, they can tell you what happened. But if they're confused or have dementia, they can't tell you what happened. So the priority action of the nurse in that case is to assess the patient before you even move them and make sure that they're, they haven't sustained any type of injury. Make sure that they have range of motion of the lower extremities, especially of the hips, right? Not that they have one foot that is internally rotated, because that's a sign of a fracture, a fracture, or that one leg is longer than the other. That's also a sign of a hip fracture. And make sure there's no head injuries. And so when you document that, let's say you assess them, take their vitals, everything's fine, you get them up. Well, that's your they can't tell you what happened. Old and sick, she can come live with us. Um, Jarrett wants me to let you know if you ever get old and sick, you can come live with us. Oh, he's a good, see, such a good son. I love you, honey. I'm looking She's at nothing. A, such I'm, a good I'm, son. Yeah, I know. He's in the crack son. of the door. You guys wait. All right. Have fun. Don't bother me. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So you assess your patient and it, it appears that they've not sustained any injuries. You get them back in bed, whatever. And now you're going to go document. So number one, 
that's an incident report, right? Anything that's out of the ordinary would be an Is incident. Is that the same as a variance report or are no. those different? Okay. They're different. So an incident report is an internal document that's used for risk management and quality assurance. So if something happens like a fall or a med error, you're going to document specifically what happened so that risk management can look at it and say, all right, wow, we've had four falls on this unit. What can we do? What is there a common denominator? They do something called a root cause analysis to figure out what caused those events to happen and then what we can do in the future moving forward to prevent them from happening, right? So an incident report does not go in the patient's chart. An incident report does not get faxed to the doctor. It goes to no one. It is an internal document. It goes to the nurse manager or the risk manager or quality assurance manager, but it does not go anywhere else. When you document in the patient's chart, you don't ever use words like error or mistake ever because attorneys will take that and when it goes to court, by the way, or even the deposition, it'll be five years from now and you won't remember who the hell Mrs. Jones was. And so the, the attorney will say, you said error, you made an error. It's your fault that she's dead, right? I've seen lawyers make nurses cry right? and, and they will. So that's why documentation is critically important. So in the patient's chart, all you would write is received patient, on floor next to bed, whatever you write the date, you write the time, receive patient on floor next to bed. Assessment reveals, and you put the vital signs, and right. then you put whatever your findings, you know, no, no observable injuries, no ecchymosis, no open areas or lacerations. Um, you know, patient denies complaints of pain. Just very boom, 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 that's it, right? Assisted patient back to bed or back into their chair or whatever you did. The end, the end. The incident report is where you write, you know, everything that that you actually did. When you're doing an incident report, you know, uh, especially with med errors, it's not supposed to be something punitive. In other words, you're not doing it like, oh my God, now I'm gonna get in trouble. Accidents happen, right? But the whole idea of it is to figure out, you know, was there any harm done? to the patient number one, and what do we do to prevent this from happening again? So, you know, if the patient felt, is the patient confused, the one that you found on the floor? Like, you don't wanna write anything in that patient's chart, like, you know, patient has been trying to climb out of bed all morning. You could put that in the incident report, right? But you wouldn't put it in, in the chart documentation. Just the facts, just the facts. The incident report is where you get more specific and detail oriented because that's what they're going to use. Like, what do we do for this, this patient to make her not fall again? You know, does that make sense? Yeah. So documentation should always be objective. And anytime the patient tells you something, you should always document it. Patient states, comma, quotation marks. Yeah. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> right. End quote. So when the patient's telling you something, that's important information too. And you want to document it, patient states come and whatever they said. Right. Um, and you always want to make sure it's subjective. You know, if you say that, for example, you know, um, you're taking vital signs. So you go in to take vital signs on Mrs. Jones and she's waving her arms around and she's trying to hit you. She's got dementia with delirium. So if you write in her chart, resistant to care, Help us understand what you mean by resistant to care, because that's a little vague, right? Mm -hmm. In that case, you want to say, you know, patient yelled out F you, quotation marks, and proceeded to take her right arm and try to slap me in the face twice, you know, or whatever happened, just the facts, you know, not what Mrs. Jones is really confused this morning, right? Just what happened, just the facts. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Um, safety issues in obtaining interpretation and communication of vital sign. So when we talk about vital sign measurements, alterations in, in a simple vital sign can give us a lot of information. For example, if you have a post-op patient and you go in to assess them and you notice there's been a drop in their blood pressure 
but an increase in their heart rate, they're losing blood. They're hemorrhaging. That's a sign, first sign of hypovolemic shock, right? You will see hypotension and then tachycardia, and then the patient will pass out and they'll die if you don't do something. So <laughs> vital signs are super important and changes in baseline vital signs are also critically important, okay? It's not like just another blood pressure. Those things are, the reason we do them is to assess the patient's homeostatic state. Are they doing well or is there a problem, right? Um, when we talk about patient-centered care interventions for vital signs that are altered, you know, there are a lot of them. So it would depend. For example, if you have a patient that is presenting dyspneic, short of breath, then, you know, the first thing that you would do is make sure that positionally they're in the high thalers, most upright position they can be in because that makes it easier for people to breathe. And then the second thing, do they have a patent airway? Pulse ox, what's their pulse ox? Assess their lungs, give them oxygen, two liters, nasal cannula. So, you know, interventions are based on the degree of change in the vital sign that we're speaking of, right? So patient is on a med surge floor and suddenly you listen to their heart and you hear and it's it's so fast you think you counted 120 or 130 beats in a minute so you know you're going to get an ekg immediately and you might even transfer them are they in afib you know we don't know what's going on so that's critical you know airway breathing and circulation are critical hypertension you know you go in and assess the blood pressure and it's 190 over 110. With blood pressure that high, the patient is on the verge of a CVA, a cerebrovascular accident, a stroke, right? So that requires immediate intervention. Um, and that is one where, you know, as a nurse, you can't independently give a medication. So that's a, you know, call the doctor. Although the answers to these questions are typically nursing interventions. If a patient's blood pressure is low, a quick fix that you can do if they're, if they're slow and they're symptomatic, they're dizzy, get their feet, get them in a Trendelenburg position, get their head down and their feet up. That will temporarily get their blood pressure up a little bit. Don't do that if they're tachycardic because then they're, in, they're going into hypovolemia. So you wouldn't do that. But if they're just hypotensive, their blood pressure is low, you can bring their blood pressure up a tad by doing that until you get a hold of the doctor and try to figure out what's going on. Okay, so those are patient centered interventions. Um, and again, with delegation, just remember when you're delegating a task to an assistive personnel, never delegate anything you can eat. That stands for evaluate, assess, teach, or treat. AIDS cannot teach, they can't reinforce teaching. They cannot. They can't teach somebody how to use a walker. They can't teach anything at all. That's a nursing. That is a skilled thing that needs to be done. So what you're, you're, so when you say that, so you're saying that assistant personnel cannot eat. Right. Never delegate anything that you can eat. Right. Because right. you evaluate. Because you they assess, cannot do teach, that. Because they treat, cannot they do can. those things. Right. Cool. They can't do dressing changes. They can't do ostomy appliance changes. They cannot do any type of education. They can do task-oriented things on stable patients. They can do EKGs. They, they can do can. bed baths and stuff, right? Oh, yeah, they do personal. I'm sorry. So, yeah, they do personal like care. Like personal care, yeah, yeah. Right. So they are equipped because that doesn't require any evaluation, right? Right. So personal care, they can do bed baths and showers and, you know, shampoo and on personal hygiene, ADLs. Let's say you need a patient ambulated and you don't have time and the patient is stable. You can direct the assistive personnel. You can say, listen, I want you to go down to Mrs. Jones in 208, and I, with her walker, I want you to ambulate her once after breakfast and once after lunch from her room to the nurse's station and back, and then report back to me how she did. That's super specific. See how I right. said when, how far, how often, you can't just say, hey, do me a favor when you get a chance, ambulate Mrs. Jones. 
because then what you're doing is you're giving them the responsibility of using clinical judgment and they can't do that. So you have to direct them with specificity and it has to be something that is a task and they need to report back to you. And if they report back to you something that seems out of range or strange or just doesn't seem quite right, you go and check it yourself always. If it's a vital sign or a blood sugar or whatever. Okay. Okay. And I think that covers vital signs. So health assessment. What is the purpose of a health assessment? Purpose of a health assessment is to review a patient's physical, physiological state, every body system, integumentary, cardiovascular, pulmonary, endocrine, you name it, right? A head to toe assessment to make sure that they're not suffering from any kind of pathophysiological alterations, diseases, and to make sure that you know they're not having any issues. Hypertension is called the silent killer. So there are so many other diseases like that out there where there aren't symptoms. So a patient could be walking around and going, I feel fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with me, but they could be, you know, a stroke waiting to happen. So it's important for people to have annual checkups. It's important for a health assessment to be done. Um, communication skills between the nurse and the patient are critical. Um, and this goes back to nursing ethical principles. So when you are developing a rapport with your patient during the interview phase of the assessment, you know, introducing yourself, the introductory phase, you know, I'm your nurse, my name is Mary, and here's what I'm going to be doing today, and can you tell me your name and your date of birth, and tell me a little bit about yourself, and maybe why are you here? You want to do a couple things. Number one, you're establishing um, fidelity, the fact you're, you're building trust with the patient to make sure that the patient can trust you, and fidelity is one of the nursing ethical principles. You are demonstrating veracity. And veracity is telling the truth. That's another ethical principle. The way I remember veracity is a Latin phrase that's en vino veritas. In wine, there's truth. And that's how I remember veracity means truth. Okay. You are developing autonomy for the patient. In other words, the patient must be an active participant in his or her plan of care. So if the patient is a night person and they say to you, you know, I really like getting my showers in the evening. You're going to do your best to accommodate the patient, right? Because they need to be participating in that care plan, right? Um, Patient-centered care components that are important for preparing the patient and the environment for a health assessment. Let's see. An evidence-based practice related to techniques of inspection, palpation, and auscultation, okay? And how to conduct an organized this is a lot of information, right? That has to be gone over. I don't know that we're going to do it in one sitting is what I'm getting ready to say to you. Yeah. Anyway, okay. So first of all, when it comes to inspection, palpation, and auscultation, remember this, look, listen, and feel. Just remember that line. You're always going to look first, then you'll listen, then you'll feel. And when it comes to palpation, it's light palpation and then deep palpation. So in other words, the patient comes in and they are complaining of right lower quadrant abdominal pain, okay? The right lower quadrant, by the way, midway between the right iliac crest and the umbilicus, that is called McBurney's point. And that if there's pain or rebound tenderness at that site, appendicitis. So you would look, you would auscultate for bowel sounds, but when you feel, you would very lightly palpate, right? And if they go, ooh, you would never palpate it again deeper. Why? You could rupture their appendix and they can go septic and die, right? So there's a reason that there's an order to those things. When you're wanting to auscultate bowel sounds, if you palpate the abdomen first. Yeah, yeah it makes it. Yeah, you're gonna stir things up. You wanna listen before you touch, right? Okay. Um, the, the nurses, new nurses, the biggest problem they have with a head-to-toe assessment is what to do. And I'm going to give you a head-to-toe assessment in less than two minutes. You ready? I do this with my students. It, the name of it is head-to-toe, right? Just think about it. The first thing that you're going to do, you're always going to get vital signs, pulse ox, and assess pain. Those are the three things that you always do first, right? Then 
when you start with the head, how is the head? Do you feel any lumps, bumps, bruises? How's their hair? Is it shiny? Are they losing hair, alopecia? You're gonna look at their eyes. You're gonna be checking for two things, pupil reactivity and accommodation. You're gonna take your pen light and you're gonna tell the patient to just look straight ahead and you're gonna take the pen light and you're gonna shine it into the right eye and the right eye and the left eye. Both pupils should constrict consensually. You're gonna do the same thing on the left side. Both pupils should constrict consensually with the light. That, that's accommodation. No, that's light reactivity. Oh, reactivity, okay. And you're going to be measuring the pupil size. So when, when they're just normal, pupil size can be anywhere from one millimeter pinpoint up to 10 millimeters, okay? And I'll send you a little guide so you can see what it looks like. But when you radiate the light into the eye, the pupil is gonna constrict, right? And they should be equal. Equal and reactive, that's the consensual reaction. Then accommodation is you take an object, could be your pen light, and you tell them, I'm gonna bring this close to your face and yeah. I want you to stare at it. And when it's farther away, their pupils should be dilated to let more light in. And as you bring it closer to their face, their pupils both should start to constrict as they're trying to focus on the object as it gets closer to them. That's a accommodation. That's a accommodation, okay. Accommodation. I knew that, I don't know why I, cause I, I knew that. Okay, all right. But I was confused cause okay. I'm brain dead. Uh, no, you're not. And then the other thing is this, um, you can do the, it's called the H gaze. And you're, what you're doing is you're checking cranial nerves, okay? When you do the H gaze, you're gonna tell the patient, I want you to follow this pen, don't move your head. Just follow with your eyes. You're gonna go over to the right, you're gonna go up and then down, back to the middle, and then over to the left, up, down. You drew an H. Cranial okay. nerve two? That's the, is that the optic nerve? Yeah, so ocular motor. Ocular motor, is that the second? That's not the second one, that's, that's the listen. third one. On old Olympus towering tops, a Finn and German viewed some hops. I remember yeah. that from nursing school. So I have to say it. Yeah, I know the mnemonics. Oh, you do um, already? I do. Yeah, I I watched a video that um, a medical school did a song. I'm impressed. They That's did a cool. song. Somebody shared it on the Facebook page. It's the cutest little song. It goes along with the "Call Me Maybe" sound. Really? Yes, I'll oh, send I it to you. It's, it. it's very very cute. Can and you it, send and that it, to me? Yeah. Yeah, I will. It's um, because I don't have a song for that. I just know on old Olympus towering tops, a Finn and a German viewed some hops, and that's how I remember the cranial nerves. It's like it's like cranial nerve one gave me a whiff. What's that? Is that C diff? Sensory nerve guides my sniff. Olfactory is the way. Yeah. Okay. There you go. It goes along with the um, call me maybe song. Cute. Cute. All right. Um, so. So you check now, you check for um, light reactivity and consensual reaction, accommodation, and then you also check for ocular motor. Then you look at the nares, right? Are they equal? Patent is the septum midline. Then you're gonna ask them to open their mouth real wide, stick out their tongue and say, ah. And there's a reason because, ah, when they do that, you're looking number one, is the tongue midline with the uvula, the little punching bag in the back of the throat? They should be midline. If they do that, then there's a problem. They may have had a stroke, right? You're looking at their dentition. Do they have poor dentition, which can be a sign of a lot of different things, malnourishment, right? Um, drug use, whatever. Um, do they have partial plates? Do they have dentures? Do they have implants? Do they have a lot of caps? Do they have missing teeth? Do they have no teeth? What? Hang on a sec. I don't want to, I don't mean to interrupt you, but Jared wants me to just take a picture of all of us with our Raven shirts on real quick. Can we, can we pause the recording for a sec so I can just yes, run down we, there and get a picture? can, because I can actually go to the bathroom in the door staring at me. Okay, so we're gonna talk about hygiene because I think that that's one thing that I don't have a PowerPoint or anything on. So let me give you the information that I think you need. I'm gonna share my screen and let's go back to that objective list that you have and take a look at hygiene. So describe the importance of self-care and hygiene practices related to mental and physical health status. So that's important because when you look at a person for the very first time, 
the way they present themselves, the way they take care of themselves, if they're well kept versus unkempt, you know, clean, uh, poor hygiene, says a lot about a person's mental status. People who are clinically depressed will sometimes not shower for days and days. PU. People with mental illness will often dress inappropriately. That's one of the first signs of mental illness. In other words, it's 95 degrees outside and the guy comes in wearing a parka, right? So inappropriate dress and, and self-care as, as far as, like I said, does the person look like they take reasonably good care of themselves? That's very, very important because it speaks to how the patient is doing in general terms, right? Factors that affect personal hygiene. Well, things like pain. If a patient's having issues of pain, there may be you know, situations where you know, they can't bathe as frequently as they would like to, or it's difficult for them to reach certain areas of the body, right? It's because they're unable to, because of um, osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis or something. Um, when we look at mental illness, like I said, there's a whole plethora of reasons why people would not take, you know, reasonably good care of themselves from a hygiene standpoint um, that have to do with either drug addiction or, like I said, clinical depression, um, acute mania. Sometimes people that are in a manic episode, they're just go, 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 go. They won't sleep. They won't eat and they won't bathe, right? Because they're just, um, and then other things like psychoses, you know, that's back to the inappropriate dress. So somebody who's butt naked and it's 35 degrees versus the guys wearing a parka and it's 95 degrees. Um, so pain, mental state, different types of disease processes can have an impact on people's ability to take reasonably good care of their own personal hygiene. Um, for older folks, osteoarthritis is a big issue because if they have significant osteoarthritis, they're gonna have difficulty with just the minor ADLs, things like you know, oral care, right? Brushing, flossing. They may not be able to you know, perform the actions that are necessary for flossing their teeth. Um, hair, taking care of their hair, you know, shampooing it, being able to reach it, you know, being able to dry it, being able to brush it and right, take care of it. You look at somebody's nails, a person's nails tell a whole nother story. If they're very dirty and dry and thick and overgrown, that tells you a lot about either, do they have a fungus in their nails? And then if their nails are dirty, what's the rest of them look like? Um, if their fingertips are clubbed and clubbed fingertips are where instead of that little concave part at the nail bed, it just looks like a club. It's almost overgrown. That's a sign of chronic hypoxia. So people with breathing issues, like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, will have these clubbed fingers. And that's another telltale sign that you can just look and go, Ooh, breathing issues, you know, without even listening to their lungs. Um, when we look at the, um, the skin, you know, do they have, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of scars? Do they have wounds? This is another thing that goes, speaks to mental health. If you see a patient that's got multiple lacerations, ecchymosis, right, that are in all different stages of the healing process, that's worrisome because that's a telltale sign of abuse too, right? So in other words, she's got cuts on her leg that are like almost all healed, but then there's cuts on the back that are new. Yeah, that's, you know, big red light should light up. Um, Oral care is exceptionally important because that relates to nourishment. So one of the biggest issues with geriatrics, so they don't have teeth and they can't afford dentures. There are two things that Medicare does not pay for. And they're the two things that old people need the most, dentures and hearing aids. And Medicare does not pay for either of those things. And so sometimes what you'll find is you'll have a, a person without any teeth that's called edentulous. And how are they going to be able to eat? So they will often just, you know, kind of stick with soft foods and they're typically malnourished because of it, right? They can't chew or ill-fitting dentures. If they're speaking to you and they have dentures in their mouth, but the dentures are flip, flip flopping all over the place in their mouth, they're not going to be eating with those dentures. They're probably taking them out to eat 
and they're only wearing them because they're coming to see you, right? Just to make you think that everything's fine. Um, so that, and you would look at somebody's state of nourishment. Do they look well nourished? Or does their skin look dry and flaky? Like I said, does their hair look dry and flaky? You know, that is another telltale sign of poor nourishment. Um, assessment findings that support self-care deficits. And basically that's, you know, what I've been talking about, right? All these different things that you would find outside the norm. Um, whenever you're developing a plan of care for a patient, and I know earlier you said, you mentioned the word variance. So everything that we do for patients is basically a care plan, a plan of care. And it's back to the nursing process, assessment, diagnosis, planning, implementation or intervention, and then evaluation. And so when you develop a care plan for a patient, let's say the patient does have issues with nourishment, right? And we find that they are greater than 20% under their recommended body weight for their height. And their BMI is like a 17, which is very low. So we develop a care plan for this patient that has interventions as far as you know high calorie high protein snacks shakes you know in between meals um, and it's all secondary to them not having teeth let's just say right so they're not getting enough nutrition they're underweight we're going to develop a care plan that's going to relate to things that we can do in the meantime to get nutrition back into this patient like soft foods and shakes and things like that that are high calorie high protein right getting the nourishment that they need and then we're going to set a goal. And maybe the goal would be, you know, patient's weight will increase by five pounds in the next 30 days, right? That's a reasonable goal. And then you see the patient in 30 days and instead they've lost weight. That's a variance. A variance is where the care plan, the expected goal did not go as planned. Mm -hmm. so, but you would never just throw away that care plan. What you do is you document the variance. So the intervention for whatever reason didn't work and you will modify it and then try again. So that's a variance. A variance is just, it didn't go as planned. So, but you never get rid of that pathway. And they're also called pathways, pathways, care plans. There are critical pathways. All of those things mean care plan. They all mean the same thing. What's going on with the patient, actual problem, or what could go wrong with the patient, risk for problem, right? And then what are you going to do about it? How are you going to do it? Why are you going to do it? And what's the goal? What do you expect to happen in a measurable amount of time? Right? So that's what, that's everything we do in nursing is that. Okay. Um, let's see. And then infection, you've got my, um, my PowerPoint now, and you've got my lecture on infection. Just know this. Standard transmission or universal transmission precautions just means you always wear gloves if you're going to come in contact with blood or body fluid. Um, contact precautions are for things that need to be touched. So that would be like herpes simplex one, cold sores, sexually transmitted diseases, right? Chlamydia, chlamydia, HPV, right? Those are sexually transmitted. So they're contact precautions. If a patient has an infection in a wound, Contact precautions. If a patient has Clostridium difficile, C. diff, contact. If a patient has DRE, vancomycin resistant enterococcus, contact. And that's found in urine, by the way. That's another super bug. So, contact precautions are gloves, a gown, sometimes goggles or a face mask. Say you're irrigating a wound and you're afraid it's going to splash, right? Then you would prepare appropriately. A face shield or whatever. Right. And then you have droplet and you have airborne. Airborne stands alone. MTV. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Measles, tuberculosis, and varicella. And just remember, airborne, the nurse wears an N95 fitted particulate respirator. Patients in a negative pressure room, they wear a surgical mask if they need to be transported, which you don't want to do unless you absolutely have to. And they never would share a room. Whereas if you had two patients on droplet, let's say they had pneumococcal pneumonia, that's droplet or pertussis, that's droplet. You could have two patients with the same diagnosis sharing a room, and that would be okay, but not with the airborne diseases, okay? Can't do that. And then the chain of infection, that's like so easy. It's in my video, and that's in the PowerPoint. 
When we talk about a vector versus a vehicle, here's the easy way to remember it. A vehicle is inanimate. A vector is a living thing. So in other words, if you have a mosquito that transmits the Zika virus, is that a vector mm -hmm. or a vehicle? The mosquitoes? A uh, vector. Right. Vectors are living things. Vehicles are inanimate. If you have a group of people that all go to a down by the sea crab shack and they all get clams on the half shell and they all wind up with hepatitis A, right? Then you know what was the vehicle. It was the clams on the half shell because somebody didn't wash their hands because hep A is transmitted oral fecal. So, I mean, infection to me is pretty easy. And the number one protective mechanism that we have to protect us against infection, what is it? Hand hygiene? Our skin. <laughs> Our skin. Oh, oh, okay. I thought you skin. meant like the, the, the precautions that yeah, we take. that's the number one precaution. That's absolutely. And you know, if your hands are visibly soiled, you wash them. If they're not, you always, you know. The you sanitizer. Them. Right. And you rub them till they're dry. And you know, like if the patient has C. diff, even if your hands aren't soiled, you wash them. You don't use sanitizer, okay? Um, safety. So, oh, restraints. You talked about restraints. I'll give you my restraint cheat sheet too. Restraints are easy. They're always the last resort, the last resort, right? After you've tried everything else because restraints, we don't like them and the state doesn't like them. You have to have a physician's order and an order is only good for 24 hours. You have to do um, circ check, circulation checks on the patient minimally every 15 minutes if they're in wrist restraints, right? Um, because it doesn't take very long if a patient's combative and agitated and they have wrist restraints on and they're pulling, 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 they can cut off the circulation to their hands, right? You never secure a restraint to a movable portion of a bed or a chair, right? Um, you must release the restraints every two hours, minimally, right? Just to give them a breathing room or whatever, right? Um, what else? And anything that prevents the patient from moving independently or changing position independently is considered a restraint. Bed rails. All four. Yeah. 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 All four. Yeah. Unless the patient requests it or there's a doctor's order, you can't right. do it. Right. Exactly. Because it's considered a restraint. Um, when it comes to safety in the home, and the Board of Nursing loves to ask questions about home safety. The basics are, if a patient has home oxygen, oxygen tanks are never stored on their sides, they're stored in an upright position, and there should be no smoking signs everywhere. Um, electrical cords should never be run across the floor or under throw rugs. Matter of fact, throw rugs are a bad idea too when it comes to home safety. Falling and yeah. Yep, fall risk. Always identify through assessment if the patient is a fall risk. And part of that, did you guys go over like the tug test or any you know standardized assessments to to assess risk for falls? Tug test, no. I think the oh my gosh, what is it called? Where the patient stands there like with their eyes Romberg. closed. No, the Romberg. Yeah, I never heard tug test. The tug test is the timed up and go. And basically what you're doing is you're, you know, looking at your watch or your phone and you're going to have the patient get up from the chair and walk about five feet and then turn around and come back and then sit back down and see how many seconds it takes them. Because if a patient is able to just get up and walk, you're good. But if a patient does this, right, you get the picture. If they're grabbing a hold of walls or furniture in order to help balance them, right? So that's called furniture surfing, by the way. Um, any of those things is a big red flag. It means that, you know, hey, they may need maybe a physical therapy assessment. That's how you work with and collaborate with the interdisciplinary team. Physical therapy is about ambulation and transfers, lower extremities. Occupational therapy is about self-care, 
upper extremities, brushing your teeth, washing your face, washing your hair, cooking, eating. That's occupational therapy, right? And speech therapy, twofold. They're about speech, of course, right? But they're also about swallowing issues like dysphagia. Okay, so when you're collaborating with the team when it comes to safety, if the patient has poor balance and they're unable to transfer independently, maybe they need a PT consult and, and they need an assistive device like a walker or a cane or something, right, to prevent them from falling. Um, let's see, safety considerations. Do you have any questions that specifically that I could maybe answer for you? Because I feel like that one is pretty self-explanatory. I, I felt that I felt like that too when it came up. I was like, I'm not going to focus on it too much because a lot of it is. It is. Oh. It's common sense. A lot of it's common sense. Oh, oh gosh. Um. Yeah. And the activity one described the role of skeletal muscular nervous system. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's like the skeletal muscle and the muscular, all that stuff. Um, so you know, it's just how they work together to make the body move. That's right. it's just right. And how yeah, different part. and how different diseases can impact it. So, like for example, myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is autoimmune, and it's where the acetylcholine receptors are attacked by the patient's own immune system. Acetylcholine is one of the neurotransmitters that we have. So we need acetylcholine in order for our nerves and our muscles to communicate. So when I, when I, in my brain, I go, I'm going to stand up. I can stand up, right? Because there's acetylcholine that's getting sent to ena enable me for my nerves to stimulate my muscles to move my bones. They all work together. Right. Yeah. And so there are different disease processes, a lot of autoimmune. So myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis that impact mobility. Um, there are degenerative diseases like osteoarthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is both degenerative and autoimmune. So it's the worst of both. Uh, and all of those things affect, you know, balance and mobility and activity. So, you know, when we talk about uh, prevention, prevention is the number one way. It's, it's easier to prevent something than it is to treat it. It's that simple, you know? So exercise, starting an exercise regimen, not leading a sedentary lifestyle, not being overweight, right? Being in your weight range for your height and your stature. Um, and then when it comes to ergonomics, that again, that's pretty self-explanatory as far as moving patients, remember, if you're moving a patient that's immobile and you're using a draw sheet, you never pull. You must lift and pull so that you don't shear their skin. Friction it's, rub. Yeah, well, yeah. It's, it's, uh, no, not a friction rub. Oh, is it's in you, the lungs. Or the heart. You can have a pericardial rub also if you have pericardial effusion or pleural effusion would be a pleural rub. So, but a skin tear is what can happen if you just pull the patient on the draw sheet. So you must lift and move, right? You never, you never drag a patient across the bed is what I'm saying. Um, you should always keep your stance. Your feet should be as far apart as your hips. You should never have your feet close together. You should never bend at the waist. You should always use your thighs, your legs when you're lifting something. Um, if you, if it's something that's over like 10 or 20 pounds, get help. Don't do it yourself. Um, nursing care, select nursing diagnoses involving mobility. I, I think I asked you, do you have the current NANDA list? That's the other thing. Let me see if they, I think they posted. Here, I'll just give you mine. I have the, the most recent NANDA list. Hold on. Stop sharing. Uh, I'm actually going to stop the recording. Okay. I think we're, we pretty much covered everything and I'm sending you everything I have for, for this part of the program.